Good morning to you. Welcome to Kingdom Shakers on Life 97.5 FM, where we chat with believers in Christ who are using their gifts to fulfill their purpose around the world, anywhere around the world. And today I'm so honored to chat with Dr. Ron Stewart. He is retired, but he was a pastor for 50 years, and now he goes around preaching the word of God and he imparts his wisdom and his knowledge wherever he is called to do so. Good day to you, Dr. Ron Stewart. Good morning. Good to be with you. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us all the way there from Tennessee. And mm -hmm. um, we just praise God for what he's doing in your life. And we know that you have a, a wealth of knowledge and wisdom and experiences to share with us today. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Well, Dr. Stewart, tell, tell us about um, Dr. Ron Stewart, um, maybe starting off with Ron Stewart, the boy, and um, how you would have grown up, what was life like for you? Uh, it was a, a, a difficult childhood in many ways, but uh, I was not raised in a Christian home. Uh, nobody in my family, not, I had four grandparents, none of them went to church. Uh, my parents never went to church uh, in my entire life. My, in fact, my total family, two brothers and I, and my parents never went to church together. Mm. Uh, I did not go to a church. I not, did not attend a church until I was 15 years old. Wow. And I was ever inside of a church. And uh, some people, uh, some boys that I ran around with, they just, one of them had a girlfriend who went to church. And so we all decided we'd go to church with mm. them one day. We all sat on the back row up against the wall. I have no idea what the pre preacher said. Don't remember anything about it other than uh, we were back there goofing off like teenagers do right. at that time. <clears throat> and that was the, the first and only time I had ever been in church. It, I did not know anything about it, did not mean anything to me. But about a year later, my uncle, who had married my mom's sister, my aunt, uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he went to a church. It was a free will Baptist church. And uh, he was radically saved. He was a big ex-Marine. Uh, he was about six foot two, weighed about 250 pounds, had the wow. voice of God. And uh, he took me fishing with him and uh, did some things. So I liked him. He was funny. We hung out together. And then he started asking everybody in the family to church. Come on, go to church with me. Go to church with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a couple of them did. I think my mom and dad even did maybe once. Uh, and then I went with him. And the second time I went with him, I was, you know, again, about probably 16 almost uh, by this time. And uh, living in the inner city in Columbus, Ohio. Um, had no restrictions. My parents never gave me a curfew. I could go do whatever I wanted to. I, I was swimming across the Ohio when I was about 10 years old with an inner tube and two or three other of my buddies. Wow. I just had no, nothing. So I was getting into trouble and doing things. And the older I got, the more trouble I got into. And that I just had no direction. I had no guidance. I uh, didn't have any moral background uh, from the church. I didn't have any discipline from my parents. Uh, they just kind of let me do whatever I wanted to do. They were working so hard just to keep their heads above water that uh, they would they assume, assumed that I was going to take care of myself and my wow. brothers as well. Uh, but when, when my uncle invited me to go with him, the, the second time I went, I remember standing in that little free will Baptist church. And I didn't know the difference between free will Baptist and the Catholic at that time. I knew nothing about, it. didn't own a Bible. And, and at uh, the end of the service, they gave an invitation and I'm not even sure what the preacher said or even who it was that was preaching. But an old man came walking back to where I was standing in that little church on a Sunday night. Uh, he had to be at least 40 years old. Uh, and uh, here I am, you know, thinking, you know, about all kinds of things. And he comes back and he asked me a question. He said, Ron, would you like to receive Jesus as your Savior? Mm -hmm. And I'm not really sure what was going on in my mind. I know my life was pretty, pretty mixed up and confused at that time. And when he said that, the boy who had made so many bad choices made the greatest choice he's ever made in his life. Amen. 
Amen. And I said, yes. And I went down to the front uh, of the church and with him and uh, my aunt and uncle who were there and, and my other, uh, and other members of the church, they all gathered around me as they do in a free will Baptist church. And uh, we prayed and prayed and I invited Jesus Christ into my life. And at that time, when I was there, my, my aunt said something to me. And what I, I asked, I told her was, I want to see my parents saved. And I'm 16 years Amen. old, Amen. Never the church and all that. So I go back to the same school, same inner city school, the same friends that are going in the same direction I was going, mm -hmm. the same parents, uh, the same community. And my life began to change. And that was a defining moment in my life. A defining moment is where you make a decision that changes your life from that point on. And within that same year, my mom and dad received uh, uh, an inheritance from an uncle that they didn't know anything about. They knew him, but they didn't know he had any money. And he had enough. Where, uh, they got enough money to put a down payment on a house. And they moved out of that inner city area, out mm -hmm. into the rooms. I started to a new school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, starting to a new school, within about three months, I met the woman who was going to change my life again. And that became my wife for over ah. 50 years. Wow, and, uh, over, over how many years? The basketball team, the number one uh, pitcher on the baseball team and uh, graduated from high school. I was the first one from my family, my immediate family to graduate from high school. My two brothers, my mom and dad, my dad had to drop out of school in the, after the eighth grade uh, because it was the depression and he had to work on the three C camp uh, to be able to provide money for his family. And so uh, my life just changed drastically. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, who was the, the nicest person, the opposite of me. I was a city boy. She was a farmer's daughter. Her dad had a big farm. Uh, and uh, she had never done anything wrong except date me, I guess. <laughs> uh, but she had never done anything wrong. She was uh, the, just uh, the proper girl, beautiful girl. Mm -hmm. uh, she was in the uh, Ohio, uh, Miss Ohio contest um, at one time. Uh, and I just... Uh, I fell madly in love with her, and for some reason, she did me too. Uh, I graduated, she graduated the following year, and we got married. I uh, had four beautiful kids, but she was raised in a Methodist church all of her life, baptized when she was 10 days old, uh, and, and knew all the Bible stories. I didn't know any of the Bible stories when I was saved. I, I knew very little, didn't own the Bible, as I said, and all that. But when she went to church with me, when we started dating, we actually went to church where I had been saved uh, with my aunt and uncle. And uh, she started hearing the gospel and she realized she didn't know what salvation was. And so the nicest person I ever met in my life had never been saved. And she was saved then. Amen. To make a story a little shorter, my, my mom then was saved not long after that. And uh, the miracle of miracles is when my dad was saved when he was 51 years old. Amen. Uh, had, had, he and I had never had a, conversa a serious conversation. He was what I call a shadow dad. He was in the house, but he was doing his own thing and, mm -hmm. and uh, wasn't there for me. But when he was saved, he too was radically changed. And my, the relationship between my mom and dad, I always told them, I said, I, as a teenage boy, I felt like I was a referee, not a son. Oh. And I was always stepping in between them and, mm. and all the things that uh, they were fighting over and everything. After that, my mom said she never loved him anymore in her Amen. life. Amen. She, Amen. Yeah, the two so of them were so close and, and God just literally transformed their marriage and Amen. trans family. I then saw my youngest brother say when he was about 20 years old and my oldest brother, who was my model in life, uh, he's what I wanted to be. 
He became, he quit school in 17 and became a Marine. Big, tall, handsome, dark haired guy. And I was not quite as tall as him, three and a half years behind him. Uh, and I was skinny. Uh, and I, all I wanted to do was play ball and date girls. Oh. And, and uh, he, uh, he never would, would accept Christ mm. in his, his life. And I prayed for him every day and every year. And uh, he, he contracted cancer when he was about 68 years old. And I talked to him on the phone. We lived in different cities and talked to him, went to him. And um, just a few days before he died, I, I, I had to call him. I called him again from my church office where I'd become a pastor and all of that. And uh, I said, Jerry, I've asked you a lot, a lot of times and talked to you a lot of times about this. I've even prayed that God would send somebody to your house. And he did a few times uh, when, when a pastor just stopped by uh, uh, knocking on doors and talked to him, but he never received Christ. And I said, Jerry, would you be willing to, to accept Christ as your savior now? And um, with tears in his voice and tears in my eyes, uh, I led him through the sinner's prayer. And God gave me the privilege of seeing what I had said on my knees the day I was saved. I want to see my family saved. Amen. Amen. All of them have been saved. My mom Amen. and dad are with the Lord. Uh, Jerry is with the Lord uh, now, but they're all in heaven. And so changed my life. So 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 the message there too is never give up on your family despite praying despite um talking with them praying for them uh exactly. you know you you would have had to do this for a number of years as well and god was, came through yeah, it was 40 years 40, 40 years. years i prayed for him and uh, he turned me down over and over again after 40 years wow. he did and i preached his funeral with all of his buddies there and all of those guys that he was a, had become very successful in, in a lot of ways uh, in his career. And uh, I got to share that story with mm -hmm. all of his and all the family. And well, it was well, a testimony. Well, well, let's backtrack even a little bit. Well, a bit. <laughs> because yes. uh, you, you would have had a successful job, a mm -hmm. comfortable secular career as as, as I see on your bio uh, yes. with General Motors and then mm -hmm. God called you into ministry. Could you yes. tell us about that experience? Well, after my wife and I were married and we, she wanted babies. And so within two, two years later, we started having one of our four children and uh, we decided uh, uh, that the church, the free will Baptist church where we're going was on the other side of town. And uh, we, our neighbors then had moved in there from Texas and they said, uh, they invited us to go over to their church, which was only a couple of miles away. And it was a Southern Baptist church. And I didn't know anything about Southern Baptist church. I didn't know much about uh, anything, but we had been going to church uh, at that free will Baptist church along the way. And, and so my wife was pregnant with our first child and we went to visit that church. And the following Friday, she had that baby. And the pastor was in that hospital visiting with her uh, at that time. We started going to that church and uh, I became a deacon there when I was about 24 years old. Wow. And uh, I taught Sunday school, Becky taught Sunday school. Uh, she, was, she was just so active and full of energy. Uh, she did everything in the church you could possibly do. And it was a church of about uh, 200, 250 people uh, at the time. And um, I was doing so much, and, and I, I just kept having that feeling, you need to be doing more. You need to be doing more. And, and I, I, in my little mind then, I said, but, but Lord, uh, the, 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 uh, I'm doing everything that I can do now. The only way I could ever do more is if I did this full time and quit my job. And it was like a light bulb went off. And I thought, that's what he wants. Wow, amen. And so the first person I went to was my pastor at the time. And uh, he asked me, uh, well, what can you do? And I said, well, nothing. The only thing I've been successful at in life really has been in athletics. And he said, there's such a thing as a, 
a youth pastor where you uh, deal with the children, the kids, the teenagers. And I thought, well, that sounds fine with me. And he said, gave me the greatest advice anyone's ever given me. I graduated from high school. I'd taken some night courses in college and always wanted to go to college, but, but I, I, I never saw it at that point. But he said, Ron, if you're going to be a pastor, then you need to get a college education. You need to train yourself. And I said, well, I've always wanted to. Uh, he said, what do you suggest? And he said, well, there's a church down in Nashville, Tennessee called Belmont University. And um, I'll take you down there. So uh, Becky and I, oh, and then that night I went home and told Becky after we put the kids in bed, I said, Becky, I want to tell you something. I said, I believe God is calling me into the ministry. And her exact words were, I know it. Ooh, that's a woman of God right there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, God was calling me. He was calling her. We had at 25 already received, gotten our, our dream house. God had blessed us so much. We had a house more than we ever thought we were, bigger than my, all, both of our parents' houses and, and more expensive. And uh, we sold that house and everything that was in it. And um, I put everything I owned into a U-Haul truck to, to move down there. But before I did that, in that visit that we had at Belmont, um, I, I was still working at a job that, that was great, making all kinds of money in that direction. But uh, I went down there and um, I said, well, I need to have some scholarships. And this was in April of 1970. I said, because if, if I don't have a scholarship, I'm not gonna have a job. So I won't be able to afford this. And they said, well, what do you suggest? And I said, well, can, is, there, can, is, is it possible to get a basketball scholarship? I said, well, we don't know. So let's go talk to the coach. So my pastor and Becky and I went in to see the basketball coach at Belmont. Name was Dewey Jones. And we sat there and talked. And Dewey said, the coach said, uh, if you'll come down here in uh, September, and if you're good enough to make the team, then we'll give you a scholarship in January. Yeah, I said, yeah, I said, coach, that won't do me any good. No, I have, four, I have three preschool kids. I'm quitting my job and I'm moving down here. And if I don't have the scholarship, then I can't do any of that. And he said, well, what do you suggest? I said, do you have any size 11 tennis shoes? I said, give me some shoes in your shirt, get your boys together and give me a tryout today. Wow. It was lunchtime, so he we uh, walked up the, uh, through Belmont, beautiful campus, and um, went to the cafeteria, and he, we were going to eat a little bit of lunch, and as we walked, he saw his boys, and he said, guys, we're going to play at 2 o'clock, we're going to play at 2 o'clock, kept picking them out, biggest, ugliest guys I'd ever seen, you know, he's picking <laughs> play, and so after we ate, we went down, and we played three on three, Becky sat up in the balcony uh, with the coach, and uh, half court, and we played for about an hour. And uh, we just took one after another. And uh, it was, um, I, I evidently I did something right because he took me out to dinner that night. Oh, and, offered, and offered you? Offered me a scholarship at Belmont University, yes. Amen, wow. And uh, we went back home, we put our house on the market, it sold. Uh, the Friday before I was to move and load up my U-Haul truck, I loaded up my U-Haul truck with everything I had, moved out of this three-story house that we lived in, into a, a subsidized housing, government housing wow. in uh, Tennessee, where I could almost reach my arms across uh, sideways and I could, uh, I could touch both walls in the kitchen. Oh, my. So, so, our kitchen in our 27 feet long. Uh, and uh, so, but uh, I put everything in the U-Haul truck and uh, Becky and the kids had to stay another day or two. I drove down to Knoxville, got a couple of boys from the uh, basketball team to help me unload into this new apartment that I was moving, the tiny little apartment that I was moving three children into. Got a, uh, took the U-Haul the truck, went down to the U-Haul station, dropped off my, my truck 
got a bicycle out of the back of the, the U-Haul truck, drove it, rode it back to the apartment. And for the next two days before Becky and the kids came down, I, I did everything on a bicycle, not so, going so. into town. And uh, it was just a, God began to work. I started a college in September of 1970, mm -hmm. preached in two or three places. And uh, then I was asked by the school if I would want to go out to this one particular church, First Baptist Church in Christiana, Tennessee. I said, I'll preach anywhere. <laughs> Let me know. I uh, drove 40 miles to get there. There were 32 people in the, in the church. And I was for the seventh time I'd ever preached in my life. And they were looking for a And I had my wife and my kids there, which was always a good calling card for me. Uh, and uh, and they they loved Becky, of course, everybody did, and, and kids. And um, they asked me two questions, said, uh, are you looking for a church? I said, yes, sir, I'm looking for a church. Are you willing to live on the field with us in the parsonage? I said, yes, sir, we are. And that's where I saw the parsonage. Uh, if I had seen it, I might not have done that because it was terrible compared to what we had been living, even in the apartment we had. Wow. But uh, but just just did that, and uh, we started there in that church. I went through college in uh, the four years of college in two years and seven months because I thought I was an old man and needed to hurry up. Graduated from there, went to Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, pastored a church before I even started my first class in Worthville, Kentucky. Uh, went through the three years master's program in a year and 11 months. Wow. And I graduated from there, went back to Ohio, in a little church in Piqua, a Baptist church in Piqua, Ohio, where I stayed for four years and then went uh, down to Lebanon after that to the Northside Baptist Church. And from there, I got a call from the church in Knoxville, Tennessee. And after nine years in that church, we had grown, we had purchased more property and every one of my churches had doubled, tripled, quadrupled in attendance Amen. while I was there. And uh, I went down to this church and um, I was looking for a big empty building where all I had to do was go preach the gospel and go out and visit people and, and win them to the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and God just opened the doors. We went from 250 people to over 2,000 people. Amen. Ooh. We ever had in church on any given day was 6,000 people. Amen. And Amen. Started a, a Christian academy there, Grace Christian Academy, one of the highlights of my ministry. Uh, has about 900 and some students, I think, uh, still today. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a tremendous ministry to the entire community. Well, uh, well, well, Dr. Ron, you know, in all that you're saying, um, you've obviously made a number of sacrifices in order to do the work of God. No one. doubt. And, and secondly, you know, people would have probably on the outside who would not have understood what was happening would have said, this is, this is, not, this is not good. You know, you might not have been making good decisions and, and so on. How, how would you have responded to those people if you encountered anyone who would have? Well, I did. My, my mother. <laughs> oh. Uh, <clears throat> she uh, was always my hero growing up anyway. And uh, whatever she said, you know, uh, was, was something that I always tried to follow. And uh, she said, Ron, are you sure about this? And um, I told her, I said, yes, mom, I think this is where I should be and what, what I need to be. And I, I knew she was anxious about it, but uh, she never said, or oh, she just said, all right. And she, tried to help us and supported us as much as she could uh, during the time frame. Uh, and my dad stepped in there too, because he had been safe for a few years now. And, uh, and that was a, a good situation. Yeah, people may have said that, but <clears throat> once I got down there, once I got in that motion, when I received that basketball scholarship, I said, from my earliest years, I wanted to go to college. Uh, in fact, I, in the ninth grade, I took a college curriculum uh, in, in the school. I never had any trouble in, um, in doing my studies in school. I was always a good student. 
I just didn't want to go to school all the time. And so that hurt me, you know, yeah. taking the classes, you know, Latin and algebra and geometry and all those things. Uh, and uh, so I didn't have any trouble. But when I had the opportunity to go to college to fulfill a lifelong dream, I was focused and I was willing to pay the price. And my wife was willing to pay the price. And she did. Uh, she cleaned houses for a while to be able to make I made $60 a week when I took that church. It took me 10 years to even get back to even uh, as a pastor before I even got where I had been uh, in my, uh, my, my career earlier. Uh, and yet, I would do it all again. I would do every bit of it again. It was the greatest decision of, of my life. And God gave me exactly the wife I needed and uh, gave me great kids. Both my, past my sons are pastors now. Uh, one is a pastor here in Alcoa, which is why I'm living in this area. My youngest son, uh, he has a, a, the Foothills Church here, has over 2,000 people. I started that church uh, about 15 years ago, I believe, uh, here before I retired. And it grew and grew, and then he took it over, and uh, uh, and uh, they were just seeing my videos of my, of my other church where I was the pastor of. And uh, so he's a pastor. My oldest son is an international mission board uh, of the Southern Baptist Convention missionary in Zambia, Africa. And he's two years now. And uh, they're just great kids. Um, my uh, youngest daughter is a, a developer in real estate, does a great job there. Uh, had nine grandchildren. Uh, and my oldest daughter, who was an architect, came to me in the fourth grade and said, Dad, I'm going to be an architect. And she was tragically died uh, at the age of 51, just about three, four years ago. And that was sad, just uh, 10 months after her mother died. Ooh, I'm sorry so, to hear uh, that. Condolences. Yeah. Condolences. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, you, you have accomplished so much, Dr. Ra. Um, I, I, I'm seeing as well that you are a strong advocate for using media to reach people uh, with a life-changing message of Jesus Christ to the miracle of grace. That's the church's radio and television programs. And you mentioned as well um, of uh, doubling or tripling, or is it tripling and quadrupling the, the church numbers? I know that there are people who are listening. Unfortunately, my time has just about run out, but I'm on borrowed time right now, but okay. I, you know, I, I, I feel as if I could spend an hour talking with you, <laughs> Dr. Ron, but I know that there are people listening who might want to know how you would have gotten that done. You know, you would have gone to a church and tripled or quadrupled the numbers because in, in a time when people are just not as receptive as they used to be, how would you have yeah. gotten that done? Yeah, people are no different now than, than they have ever been mm -hmm. back times. People are hurting. People are in need. My basic philosophy in, uh, in pastoring a church is find a need and fill it. Just find a need and fill it. Look out to the community. Ask your members, what's the greatest need that people have in this community where we are? And listen to what they're saying and, and then seek it out. And once you discover what that need is, then fill it. What do we have to do then as a church to be able to meet the needs that the people, the majority of the people in this community have? And so when I moved to Grace, uh, it was a, a church out in the suburbs, had been there for about 75 years and I had done something but had not done too much uh, through the years. And I, I, I saw that people were moving into that neighborhood, young couples. What do young couples look for first? Not a church. They look for some kind of child care. They want their children taken care of, a school or, or something like that. So I said, let's start an after school program. Let's start a program where we will go pick up the children whose parents work and we'll bring them back to our 
our facility, we had a gym by that time. I built a gym, uh, a family life center two years after I was there. And I said, we'll fill this up with kids. Their parents will come, the parents would come in and they'd start talking. I put leaders in charge of that who were church members. They'd talk to them about their, their personal life. The parents would start coming to church. The kids would say, I want to go to this church. I want to go to this church. And they would go. And so we did that. So I used that, that philosophy in a lot of other ways as well. And so I started uh, not just the after school, but I started a daycare program where we took care of the babies. Uh, because when they have babies, they want they want to find some place. Right. We get brand new facilities and all, all of that. And then that's when eventually then, a few years later, I started the academy. And well, I didn't have to go out and find the people. They came to me. And I just had to get the right people in the right positions. We, we ended up employing, I think, about 200 people. Uh, and, and those people that were involved in it were Christians sold out to the Amen. Lord. Amen. And then I had exciting worship services. I focused on preaching. Mm -hmm. I, I Focused on preaching. I had marriage conferences every year for 35 years. Wow. Bringing the, the couples. Because I taught a Sunday school class. I would preach two services. I'd preach at one early one. Then I'd teach a Sunday school class of young couples. And then I'd come back and preach again the same message. And then I'd come back and preach the Sunday night. And I would share with those young couples, you're going to be the leaders of this church in a few years. And today, guess who are the leaders in that church? Amen. Amen. They, oh, they've seen it all. They, that is they, powerful. And they saw and they were able to, to follow through with it. So find a need and fill it. Preach biblical sermons because the Bible is the answer to the questions that people have who come in there. In that, that They come in saying, preacher, do you have a word from God for me today? <laughs> My responsibility was, I'm going to study, I'm going to pray, I'm going to research, and I'm going to write so that God, I'll be in the, in the mood where God can give me the word that at least one person in that audience needs to hear today. That is so powerful, Dr. Ryan. You know, you, you've given us so much to think about and to really chew on, and I, I want to thank you so much for sharing with us today. You, you've, been, you've been in this now since... This would be what, 41 years? Well, right? 1970, I started. So it's 51 years. 51 now. years, sorry. Yes, that's correct. Wow. I'm still a little bit around. Yes, yes. Well, is there one valuable lesson that you wish to pass on to us? Well, the, the first thing I was that everybody can be a pastor, everybody is a pastor. You are all, as, as adults, you are all the pastor for your family. I was the pastor for my family first mm -hmm. and then the pastor of the churches I served. And my goal was to raise my children in something I didn't have. I never went to church until I was 15 years old. As I said, we had all four of our babies in church by the time they were two weeks old. We put them in wow. Sunday school. Uh, we had them there all, and the number of times that they missed going to church in, in their years that they lived in our house, you could count on one hand. Now, there were times when they said they were sick. I told them they were not. Go ahead, throw up, and, and, but you're not sick, you know. But we made that a priority. You have to make it a priority because you are the pastor. They're watching you. You are their heroes as the parents, and you must not just tell them what you believe, but you must live what you believe because what you are doing speaks so loudly, they won't hear the words you're saying. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron. Dr. Ron Stewart, all the way there in Alcoa. Al Al Alcoa, yes? Mm -hmm. I yes. said it correctly. Okay, Alcoa, Tennessee. Thank you for sharing a bit of your life with us here on Kingdom Shakers and Life 97.5 FM. Uh, you would have pastored for, been in ministry for 51 years. I know you retired. You would have built churches and you have a, a, a strong media ministry as well. Uh, you are president of the Tennessee Baptist Convention, a trustee of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, ten, Kentucky, and also served on the board of trustees at Carson Newman College. I know there's still a lot 
we can learn yes. from you, Dr. Ron. But we thank yes. you for your obedience to God mm. and for being such a light to the world for so many years. God bless you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you. Thank you so much. God bless.